All right. Uh, we are we are very happy to have Zushi Lu from KITP Santa Barbara. She's gonna tell us about gravity dual of easing CFD all genus. Zushi, Hello, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Hello everyone. I'm going to talk about gravity dual of easing CFD and the dualities for arbitrary genus. So this is based on a collaboration with Chao Ming, uh, Andreas, Hao Yu, and Zheng Han. So we would like to study the gravity dual of 2D easing CFT. It is dual to a three-dimensional pure gravity. Um, there are a lot of adjectives describing this gravity, so like, let me explain them one by one. This gravity is three-dimensional. It's in a Euclidean signature. It's pure, namely there's no matter field. It has negative cosmological constant, or it, we call it the, in the anti-distillar space. It is at strong coupling, or in a quantum regime. So I will describe what I mean by the quantum regime later. And it, it has a Brown and U central charge, C equals three L over two G equals one half. So it's called a central charge, but it's a gravitational quantity. It's defined as three times the curvature radius of the geometry divided by twice the Newton's constant. Um, and this uh, duality is for arbitrary genus. And we established this, this duality by matching the Persian functions of the gravity side and the CFT side. The outline is the following. I'll first I'll briefly introduce the ADS3 space and then introduce the Brown and New theorem, which lays the foundation of uh, the possibility of uh, ADS3 CFT2 du uh, duality. And then I'll review a uh, genus one argument that was proposed in 2011, which, con which conjectured uh, the duality between easing CFT and uh, uh, pure gravity. And then um, I'll talk about our result for arbitrary genus and finally discuss several interesting questions. Excuse me, I have a very quick question. Sure. So if the central charge is uh, just one half, this is a very small central charge, then does it make sense? Uh, is, is it, does it make sense to distinguish matter from black hole? Because you said it's a pure gravity that only contains uh, black holes, but no matter. But right. if the central charge is uh, this far from semi-classical, I don't think the distinction is meaningful. Um, so uh, in a, in a semi-classical regime, there is a um, Cardi's, form, uh, Cardi's uh, constraint saying that uh, the primary, field, primary states with uh, conformal weights larger than C over 24, uh, can, can be interpreted as black holes. So uh, um, we can use a similar argument here. Um, for, for example, I think usually if the central charge is large enough, mm -hmm. then uh, you can use the Bekenstein Hawking formula to say that this state is dual to a black hole and this the other one is not. But if the central charge is so small, I don't think the distinction is invariant. Okay, I'll talk about the Bekenstein Hawking entropy near the end of the in the discussion part. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll I'll uh, let's discuss until then. So the um, here is a brief introduction to the 3D ADS space. So here is a Einstein Hilbert action. Um, uh, G is again a Newton's constant. Small g is the metric. R is the uh, scalar curvature. Lambda is the cosmological constant. It is negative one over L squared. R is the L is the curvature radius of the uh, geometry. The equation of motion gives the Einstein's equation, and there is no local propagating degrees of freedom in this system. So, namely, no gravitational waves. We only have some uh, global type of excitations. The simplest solution to the equation of motion is the empty ADS3. Um, more or less, it's like the ground state of the ADS3 geometry. Um, general geometries are locally isometric to these empty ADS3s. Can I ask a question that may be related to the last question? Sure. Um, if, if the curvature, I would guess, in this space would be roughly the Planck scale because there's no small parameter in the central charge or whatever the central charge. Right. Are you really going to be justified in talking about the Einstein-Hilbert action? What suppresses higher curvature terms? Mm -hmm, that's a good question. This this um, this is related to the, related to a later re, uh, assumption that I will discuss later. 
So uh, uh, at large C, uh, one is justified to talk about the classical settle points or, or the solutions of, of Einstein's equation. But for C of order one, there's um, really no reason to say that uh, in general, the classical settles will dominate, but this will be an assumption uh, of, of the work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, okay, so general geometries that differ from MP803 can be obtained using uh, a, a quotient of the isometry group of the ADS3. So there are no local propagating degrees of freedom, but there, there are global interesting uh, geometries, for example, the BTZ black holes. Uh, BTZ is just the combination of first letters of the three people that discovered them, discovered it. Um, and so classically, this einstein hilbert action can be written as two copies of Chen Simon's theory with uh, opposite chiralities. The gauge group is SL2R cross SL2R. In a Euclidean signature, uh, it will be uh, SL2C instead. So the brown new theorem um, is a precursor of the ADS3 CFT2 duality. So if we look at the uh, symptotic, near the asymptotic boundary or near the space-time infinity, um, the metric that is asymptot asymptotically ADS3 is the following. Um, so the metric obtained from the ADS3 transformation acting on the metric must also be asymptotically ADS3. That is, this is how we uh, obtain this metric. And generators of boundary condition preserving different morphisms will form two copies of Verasoro algebras at infinity after quantization. So this is the content of the theorem. Basically, it just says the symptotic symmetry of uh, ADS3 is uh, um, the Verasoro symmetry. So there are two central charges, CL and CR. Um, gravitationally, they are identified as 3L over 2GN. From now on, we'll call it just C, uh, Brownlee new CBH. So the mathematics behind this Brownlee new argument is that is, is due to the Sull Sullivan theorem saying that the hyperbolic geometry of the three manifold is one to one correspondent to uh, the conformal structure on its boundary. So um, apart from a lot of studies on the ADS3, uh, ADS3 CFT2 duality, the real CFT dual to the ADS3 gravity is still unknown. Um, there are a lot of, there are several candidates proposed, for example, the ex extremal CFTs, Blueville C CFTs, et cetera, but uh, uh, all of them have their subtleties and, and problems. And most of the studies have been focused on the semi-classical regime uh, corresponding to the large central charge. So, or equ equivalently, this is the weight coupling limit uh, where the coupling constant is G. So we'll, we'll consider the strong, strongly coupled case where L curvature radius L is of Planck scale, or the single charge is around one, uh, is of order one. So now I will begin to uh, review the argument by uh, Castro, Gabardil, uh, Hartman, Maloney, and Volpedo, um, which shows that the Persian function of the gravitational theory uh, on, with, at genus one is equal to the even CFT Persian function on genus one. So formally, the gravitational, the gravitational Persian function can be written as a pass integral, uh, where we fix the boundary to be a T2 a torus, and um, we have extracted the C from any here. So the integration is over syntactically ADS3 manifolds with fixed conformal structure on the boundary. Uh, the conformal structure is manifest in, in the modular parameter tau here. And we can rewrite this pass integral in terms of summation over zx tau and tau bar. This x satisfies partial x equals t squared. And um, so z of x uh, describes the, the contributions from, from all metrics on a fixed topological manifold x and are connected by small different morphisms. Uh, by small different morphisms, again, I mean the different morphisms that keep the asymptotic boundary conditions. Um, Semi-classically, this x are the solutions to the equation of motion, or the settle points, um, for C Brownian single charge equals uh, of order one. Again, so this is the assumption that I mentioned earlier. So we will assume that the pass integral is again organized as a sum over classical solutions, and the fluctuations around them. But 
but now we cannot uh, compute the like the loop loop corrections order by order. We have to compute them once and for all, compute them all together. So this was the assumption used by this, the 2011 paper, and we will again adopt it in, in our work. Now we write uh, the sum of our saddles. So as I mentioned, the simplest solution is the empty or, or thermal ADS3. So it has a topology of a solid torus. The time goes along the longitude of the solid torus or the constant time slice is a disk. So here is the metric. Um, and on its boundary, it's a T2. It, it allows for a complex coordinate Z equals negative T plus I phi. It has two periods um, here. This modular parameter tau um, physically gives the inverse temperature and the angular potential. Uh, imaginary tau is beta and real tau is theta. So they correspond to respectively um, the Hamiltonian and angular momentum. So this empty ADS3 uh, solution will dominate at large beta or low temperature limit. Um, and the black hole solutions, the BDZ black hole is obtained, can be obtained from this empty ADS3 by doing a transformation tau going to negative one over tau. In general, different settles will correspond to different uh, interiors, uh, different feelings of the torus on the centaur boundary. They're related through SL2Z transformations. So tau becomes gamma tau using a fractional linear transformation. So the, the full partition function is the summation over all settles and it must be moderate invariant. We can rewrite it as a modular sum. So we choose something called a vacuum seed and we sum over all the gamma in SL2, to, sorry, this should be SL2Z instead of SL2C. Um, so um, you sum over all the gamma since SL2Z and this gamma acts on the modular parameter tau. So I have a collision mark uh, around this equal sign here because some of these gammas are correspond to small transformations, they don't change the settle. They're just, uh, they just correspond to uh, boundary condition preserving diffeomorphisms. So the real equality is Z gravity equals summation over gamma that is not in SL2Z, but in SL2Z quotient gamma C, where this gamma C is the, uh, like some kind of gauge symmetry of the Z back. So now we need the explicit form of ZVAC. So physically it counts the boundary gravitons. These boundary gravitons are just, just the, correspond to the small diffeomorphisms from, that are continuously connected to the empty ADS3 uh, solution. So it, it has, so formally one can write it as trace, uh, trace back QL0, Q bar L0 bar. This VAC is just the, uh, just means the summation, um, over states that are connected uh, to empty ADS3 by small diffeomorphisms. So the empty ADS3 will correspond to the vacuum state zero, um, annihilated by the L0 and L0 bar in the Virasoro algebra that we discussed before. Um, and it will also be annihilated by all the Virasoro lowering operators. The boundary gravitons or the small diffeomorphisms will be just the Virasoro descendants of the vacuum. And furthermore, if we restrict to the case where C is smaller than one, and then the unitarity will require this C to, to be just a discrete series uh, of values, uh, one minus six over P times P plus one. P is an integer larger than or equal to three. And then the computation of Z back just resembles the uh, construction of irreducible representations of the Virasoro algebra. Um, um, using the cost table. So removing the null states, so we only want the states that are, that are positively normed. So we need to remove the null states and then ZVEX just becomes chi 1 1 norm squared. It's the character of the irreducible verbal module of the, which corresponds to the vacuum conformal block uh, of, a, of the versal algebra. This 1 1 is just, a, just means the, the trivial conformal block. At central charge C equals one half, uh, specifically this ZVAC has a form of one four square root of theta three plus square root of, th of theta four. This theta is the Jacobi theta function and eta is the Dedekind eta function. Um, and then, so now that we have the expression for ZVAC, we need to 
do the modular summation. Um, for Brownian new central charge, C equals one half. Um, so there are three primary fields, one sigma psi. So this would, this, we have already um, translated the problem in, in gravity to the problem in uh, rational CFT. Um, so we have three primary fields for C equals one half CFT, one sigma psi. It, they correspond to the characters chi one one, chi two one, chi one two. And in this basis, the generators of the SL two Z are S and T. So we can act repeatedly these generators on the ZVAC um, and obtain a set of terms. So we repeatedly act S and T until the set saturates. And then the set contains 24 inequivalent uh, contributions. The modular sum, so the summation over these 24 contributions will give eight times the Z of easing, uh, the Z, uh, partial function of the easing CFT. So where the uh, z easing is defined as norm squared of the summation of four chi's. Um, so one can do similar analysis for the for other brown new central chargers. For example, the next one is c equals seven tenths. Um, so it, it still work. The z gravity in that case would be equal to forty eight z of tricritical easing, but it that no longer works for higher uh, Brown new central charges because for for all other for other cases the the corresponding CFT have multiple modular invariants. So starting from chi one one norm squared, starting from the ZVAC, you do the modular summation. You can uh, in general you will get a, some kind of combination of different modular invariants of the component field theory. So there is you cannot claim that the gravitational partial function is equal to the partial function of the uh, CFT. So now we're, we, we'll switch to the higher genus case. So um, the Taurus case um, contains, so the Taurus partition function of the CFT includes all data about its spectrum, but there's no non-trivial information about correlation functions. So the, the, the data against correlation functions is encoded in the higher genus CFT version functions. So that's one of the reasons we want to study higher genus, the proof is not complete unless we uh, do it for all genus. And physically, the higher genus cases are important for multi-boundary wormholes. For example, uh, a three-sided wormhole in a Lorentzian signature will analytically continue to uh, genus two uh, uh, geometry in a, in a uh, Euclidean signature. So to do the proof for arbitrary genus, we need topological quantum field theory techniques and uh, during the process, we'll obtain some new mathematical results, uh, which I will discuss later. So um, in short, we'll just prove the Z gravity is proportional to Z easing for arbitrary genus up to a uh, constant prefactor. So what, what, what we will do, so to generalize uh, from genus one to arbitrary genus, so the tau, the modular parameter tau, uh, will be generalized to a pure matrix omega. It's G cross G dimensional, where G is the genus, uh, it's symmetric, it's complex. And then um, the modular sum over gamma, uh, previously gamma is, is in SO2Z, now it will be in the uh, gamma G, which is the mapping class group of um, the higher genus Riemann surface. Okay, and, and we also have a gamma C of G, which is again like uh, some kind of gauge symmetry of the, the Z back in the, in the higher genus case. It's again, correspond to the small diffeomorphisms or physically correspond to the boundary, gra uh, boundary gravitons. So I'll first present an intuitive procedure and then uh, do the more, uh, then show you the, the general proof. So for intuitive procedure, procedure, we just identify the explicit uh, form of the Z back. So, I'll explain the meaning of this equation later, but this theta is the Riemann theta function uh, at genus G, which is basically just a generalization of the Jacobi theta function. Um, A and B are G component vectors. They take value, each component takes value in uh, either zero or one half. Um, and this A's and B's basically describe the uh, spin structures uh, corresponding to the different cycles in a, in a canonical homology basis of the uh, genus G Riemann surface. Um, omega is the purity matrix here. 
So this is a definition of a Riemann theta function. Um, so once we have this z back, we can repeatedly act the generators of the mapping class group at genus G, just like the genus one case. And then after this set saturates, we can sum over everything in this set just by brutal force, by mathematical. And then we, we are able to find that this z gravity is just some several uh, some copies of the z easing. Where the z easing was derived back in uh, the 80s by Barry Blink. So it's again some some uh, Riemann theta functions. For genus two explicitly, there are uh, 38, 40 in equivalent contributions, and they sum to 384 uh, times z of the easing. So this uh, 3840 and 30, uh, 384 differ by a factor of 10. This is related to the fact that we have 10 conformal blocks on genus two. So if you recall for, for genus one case, there are 24 uh, contributions and some of uh, they, they sum to eight times the easing. They differ by, by a factor of three. This is related to the fact that uh, there are three conformal blocks on genus one. So now I want to explain why, why we have this form of Z-back. So recall for just one, the empty ADS tree will dominate at low temperatures or large beta. Um, the corresponding uh, three manifold, it's a, it's a long, thin, solid torus. Um, so it's, it's more or less like um, there's a trivial anion propagating in, in a, uh, along the longitude of the solid torus. For a genus larger than one, uh, the low temperature uh, limit is again dominated by some copies of empty ADS3. And this limit, low temperature limit, is obtained by stretching the genus G handle body into G plus one long cylinders connected by two, three balls, like the cup and cap. Um, so the al alpha cycles, the meridian cycles, will be contractible in the bulk. So um, so the, the long direction in local coordinates, the long, the long cylinder directions can be viewed locally as time. The constant time slice would then be the G, G plus one disjoint disks. So uh, allowing the Hilbert space interpretation of boundary gravitons similar to the genus one case. So the vacuum seed would again be given by the vacuum conformal block of the easing CFT. So, so this is the ZVAC that I copied from the previous slide. We, we have chosen, so an intuitive understanding of why we chose this parameterization is that um, for, for low temperature limit uh, in an in empty ADS3 saddle, the alpha cycles will be contractible in the bulk. So for fermions, um, when, when you have a contractible cycle, uh, or the anti so you need to have anti-periodic boundary conditions or, or the bourgeois boundary conditions. This correspond to the uh, a certain spin structure uh, by choosing uh, a equals zero here. And there's so and furthermore, there's no constraint on the on the beta spin structure. So we need to do an equal weight summation of all of them. So um, this form passes all consistency checks. For example, uh, gives the correct pinching limits. And actually, mathematically, this can be derived in principle using the basis change between um, the spin basis and standard basis, which I, I will not uh, explain here. Um, the general proof, actually, is independent of the explicit form of the ZVAC. As long as ZVAC satisfies uh, the condition called homomorphic factorization. So the general proof is uh, more general than the previous intuitive procedure. Um, so we assume holomorphic factorization, and furthermore, using the previous argument, the vacuum seed is identified with a vacuum conformal block of the 2D easing CFT on the syntactic boundary. Then the mapping class group orbit of the vacuum seed is dictated by, the, by its action on the conformal blocks of the easing CFT. On genus G, there are NG number of conformal blocks, this different conformal blocks can be labeled by um, different colorings of this fusion diagram here. Um, for example, ZVAC would correspond to the case where uh, every label is, is a trivial label. There are trivial anions everywhere. 
Um, so this conformal blocks form a ng dimensional vector space and with uh, action of the mapping class group. So chi i can be equal to summation over j, rho i j, chi j. So rho g of gamma depends only on gamma, but not on the period matrix. It actually is a projective representation of the mapping class group. Um, so if the modulus sum is finite, then by construction, our the gravitational compression function is moduli invariant, and it, it, sh it should have the form of certain combinations of anti-holomorphic chi's and holomorphic chi's. B is a matrix that satisfies rho dagger B, rho equals B, which is just a moduli invariant condition uh, for arbitrary gamma in uh, the mapping class group. So with this finiteness need to be proved. Uh, we, we need to prove by contradiction. And furthermore, we can prove that this rho g, the previously mentioned projective representation is actually irreducible. These two parts are very interesting, but long and technical, so I'll, I'll not go into them uh, for today's talk. Um, so after proving these, uh, we can, so since this rho g is irreducible, we can use the short lemma and show that the matrix B appearing here should be pro pro proportional just to the identity matrix. So Z gravity is just proportional to uh, chi I bar times chi I. And this um, is the Eden Persian function for arbitrary genus. So uh, um, at this point, we have shown that the gravitational Persian function match, matches with the Persian function of, to the Eden CFT, leaving on its asymptotic boundary um, of genus G up to a constant prefactor. So we can check that, that this passes uh, all the uh, self-consistency conditions. And mathematically, this proof implies that for arbitrary, for any fixed genus G, there's only one modular invariant that can be constructed from even conformal blocks um, up to a um, constant prefactor. And also our result proves uh, what is called the extended property F conjecture. Um, from the easing moderate category. The, the extended property F basically says that the image of the mapping class group uh, is finite. So uh, previously I mentioned that the uh, tricritical easing case worked for genus one. So there are finite terms in a sum and they sum to 48 times to uh, Z of tricritical easing CF, uh, CFT portion function. But for higher genus, uh, it, it, does not, it does not work anymore. The physical, ar the physical argument still follows, but the problem is the modular sum is no longer finite. Uh, the reasoning is the following. Um, so this, the modular tensor category corresponding to the tricurial easing case contains a subcategory which has Fibonacci fusion rules. And by a theorem, um, so, the, so uh, if the tricritical easing modular tensor category has a Fibonacci fusion rule, uh, has a Fibonacci subcategory, then this tricritical easing uh, category has to split into that Fibonacci category uh, tensor product something else. And by another theorem, this Fibonacci category, the mapping class group representation of it, has an infinite image set. So the larger one, the tricritical using modular tensor category must also have infinite image set. Therefore, the modular sum of the tricritical using case must be infinite. So this is actually related to the fact that the um, Fibonacci uh, theory can be used for universal quantum computation, while uh, the easing theory cannot. So, um, so, okay, so this modular sum is infinite, and furthermore, it cannot be naturally regularized. This is related to the fact that uh, uh, the mapping class group is non minimal Okay, so, so it seems that we, we have eliminated the tricritical easing case uh, by looking at higher genus. Actually, for all other Cs more than one uh, central charges, um, similar arguments will show that the modular sum of them are also infinite. All right, so I arrived at my, uh, at my discussion part. So we have shown that the, the matching of Persian functions, but there is a prefactor. At genus one, it's, it's eight. Z gravity equals eight times Z easing. At genus two, there's this 384. It's unclear what's the physical meaning of 
of this factor means. So uh, in a in a um, in a paper for genus one, the authors argued that this aid could be absorbed into the path integral measure, but it's really unclear how it can really be absorbed and uh, uh, how to account for this genus dependence. So uh, I think one step forward would be to just do more brutal, brutal force calculations and work out the uh, genus dependence for, for high, g equals three, g equals four, et cetera, and, and try to extract the function and, and look at um, what it could possibly mean. Uh, a related, a related uh, question is the non handle body cases. So for a genus larger than one, there exist the three manifolds where, um, so they have the symptotic boundaries that are genus G Riemann surfaces, but these three manifolds are not handle bodies. So um, for in the semi-classical case, these contributions are sub-dominant, but for our case, we really need to include them to make the story complete. So this is what we were, what we are currently working on. We expect that the non-handle non body solutions will just um, change the prefactors, but we expect to still have z grab equals something times uh, z easy. Another question is, why is the uh, brown new central charge equals one half special from a gravitational point of view? Um, for genus one case. The reason why only the uh, easing and tricurgical easing cases work was because mathematically it was because the uh, uniqueness of the module invariant and physically it could be related to the fact that um, these two theories are the only two theories whose um, non-trivial primary states uh, can be interpreted as black holes, or they satisfy the, the, the Cardi's uh, constraint. But that Cardi's constraint was worked only for uh, semi-classical case, so it's, it's unclear um, uh, physically or gravitationally why this easing and tricurgical easing case were special for genus one case, and and one step forward why the tri even the tricurgical easing case um, doesn't work anymore for higher genus. And then, okay, there's another uh, thing related to topological entropy. So if we interpret um, the different primary states as different types of black holes, then we have attempted to uh, compute the bekenstein hawking entropies um, corresponding to these different types of black holes. So, and, and it turns out that this different types of black holes will have a, a correction to the bekenstein hawking entropy, which, is, which has a form of log D. D is the small D, the familiar quantum dimension of the corresponding primary, st primary state. So it's very much like the topological entanglement entropy uh, in topological phases. However, there are some subtleties in interpreting um, uh, the meaning of this topological entropy. Uh, also, it's, it's unclear whether it's uh, justified to um, identify the primary states as different types of black holes. This is related to, I think, Shu Hong's question in the beginning. Um, I think I don't have much time, so I'll skip the last two points. So the take-home message is that we, by matching Persian functions, we show that 2D using CFT is dual to 3D Euclidean pure gravity with negative cosmological constant and strong coupling and finding a single charge C plus one half. Uh, and this is done for arbitrary genus. All right, uh, thanks very much, Yushi. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have time for a few questions. Um, I have a question about the higher, the other minimal models. So sure. let's say we go to the uh, next case, the tetracritical. So, okay. so that's equals to four fifths. Mm -hmm. So as you said, there, there, there's more than one modular invariant pairing. Right. That's right. charge. So there's, there's the uh, tetracritical and there's a three state pot. Mm -hmm. So at genus one, uh, when, when you sum over the SL2Z images, you said you get a linear combination of these two modular invariant partition functions. Is that correct? Yes. One way to fix this that was proposed by the 2011 paper was to, instead uh -huh. of 
start from chi one one norm squared. You start from something else, a combination of, if I remember it correctly, is chi one one plus chi four one or something. You start from a combination. So you start from a different ZVAC and, and you do the SL2Z summation. You will indeed get only the diagonal uh, modular invariant. However, this Z, new ZVAC uh, so, uh, will, so, okay, so, but under this construction, the uh, uh, gravitational perturbation function would have, so the, the gravitational theory will no longer have a very thorough symmetry. It has a larger symmetry, the W3 symmetry. So uh, it's no longer a pure gravity. And, but is the coefficient in the linear combination positive? Uh, yes, if I remember correctly, it is positive. positive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, any other question, comments? Okay, I have a question. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this uh, remark that you mentioned the connection to universal quantum computation? Uh, uh, okay, so in, in a Fibonacci case, uh, it allows for universal quantum computation. Uh, is this related to like difficulty of simulating this system? Like the fact that you have infinity in partition function? Right, I, I don't so know, something like that. So the, the infinite image actually, the infinite image in the Fibonacci case is an advantage from the quantum computation point of view. It allows for like infinite number of gates to be realized, but for, for our case, it leads to a new oh, I see. that is hard to be regularized, yeah. Uh-huh, so this infinite response to number of gates, okay, mm -hmm. I see. All right, so if there is no further question, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, we're gonna continue our sessions next year. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye. So I'm gonna disconnect and uh, this session will end.